Hello and welcome to this uh, video on management of opioid addiction. This is from the Department of Family Medicine at RCSI Pardana and I'm Professor Anthony Cummins. Let's look at an outline of the video. It will give you some learning outcomes to begin with, then a background to development of uh, methadone maintenance programs in Ireland and Malaysia, but including a historical perspective. It will also look at the health and social consequences of illicit drug use and methadone maintenance and it will also look at management and predictors of mortality and then with some references towards the end. These are the learning outcomes for this video. You should be able to outline the prevalence estimates of problem opiate use and describe the bloodborne infections associated with illicit drug use. You should be aware of the related health and social consequences of opiate use. You should be able to summarize the management options available for treating patients who are addicts to opioids. You should be able to outline a method of maintenance treatment provision in Irish primary care. And finally, you should be able to discuss the factors that predict mortality in method or maintenance patients. Let's look at the background first of all. The Irish um, illicit opioid problem began predominantly in the 1970s. The method or maintenance programs didn't begin until about the 1990s. Specialist training is required and GPs are subject to clinical audit. There are two levels of GPs involved in um, opioid management and method or maintenance programs. There's a level one GPs who can prescribe for up to 15 patients who are previously stabilized in a methadone clinic. Then there are level 2 GPs who can prescribe for up to 35 patients and initiate treatment for patients not previously stabilised on methadone. The Irish College of GPs have developed guidelines called Working with Opiate Uses in Community-Based Primary Care to support GPs working in this area. This is a look at prevalence estimates of problem opiate use and you can see that there's been a steady rise. These are on the left hand side is the number per thousand. And then on the bottom axis are different publications in different years, ranging really from 2007 onwards. But you can see that there's clearly been a number of, uh, a, a, sorry, a steady rise in the number of people who have problem opioid use. What about the health and social consequences of problem drug use? Well, first of all, there's premature mortality. And the annual mortality is up to 3%, which is about up to 13 times higher than the general population. The causes of death tend to be an overdose, either intentional or accidental, or actions taken under the influence of drugs, there may be medical consequences such as infections and other like HIV, hepatitis C, and the consequences of those. And there may also be incidental causes such as uh, road traffic accidents, etc. In Ireland, reviews between 1998 and 2005 show there were 955 or just under 1,000 drug related deaths. 40% of these were due to single drug use, but 60% were due to polydrug use, 68% due to polydrug use. What about drug related infectious diseases? Well, the main ones one would be concerned about would be HIV and hepatitis B. In 2007, there were just under 5,000 diagnosed HIV cases in Ireland. And of these, roughly 1,400 or 29% were injecting drug users. For hepatitis B, there were 863 cases the same year. And only half of these had risk factor data reported. A percentage of whom reported injecting drugs as their main risk factor. Hepatitis B vaccine is spread through intravenous drug use, also through sexual intercourse and some problem drug users would be funding their uh, heroin habit through prostitution. So these two would be linked. 
Um, they may also get it through blood-borne products, like transfusion, and also then be with vertical transmission at the time of birth. They may present with poor appetite, abdominal discomfort, nausea, vomiting, they may be frank jaundice, a fever, or they may have upset liver functions, particularly transaminases. Hepatitis B vaccine results after the first initial acute infection of about 90%. 1% may develop usually fatal massive hepatic necrosis. Up to 10% become chronic hepatitis B carriers. 25% go on to develop chronic liver disease with cirrhosis. And some of these will go on to develop hepatocellular carcinoma. There are various markers for serology for hepatitis B. The incubation period is usually up to six months following the exposure and the hepatitis B uh, AG, a, HBSAG antigen or surface antigen is present for up to six months following the exposure. If it lasts for more than six months it usually indicates carrier status and occurs in up to 10% of those initially infected. Hepatitis E antigen is present for up to three months following acute illness, and this indicates high infectivity. Antibodies to core antigen as anti-HBC, if these are positive, indicate past infection with hepatitis B virus, and anti-HBS or antibodies to hepatitis B surface antigen alone implies vaccination. There's a chart at the bottom here will show you how the Different uh, serologies are reflected in the different phases, such as incubation, acute phase, carrier phase, recovery, and also those who are vaccinated. You can see that the LFTs in the acute phase of hepatitis B infection can be quite elevated. What about hepatitis C? This is also spread through uh, IV drug use. This also can be bloodborne and also through sexual intercourse. There is up to 70% prevalence in injecting drug users. Early stages are often asymptomatic. About 80% of them will go on to develop chronic hep C infection, and of these, further up to 30% will develop chronic liver disease as a result. So routine screening of people in high-risk groups is advisable, and IV drug users are a classic high-risk group. If they go on to develop chronic disease, then this will usually develop into cirrhosis and some will also develop hepatocellular carcinoma. What about hepatitis C serology? Anti-HCV antibodies suggest past exposure and if is HCV PCR polymerase chain reaction is positive indicates active infection. The commonest genotypes for PCR in the UK are 1, 2 and 3. And the management depends on the genotype. Interferon combined with rebavirin, if there's evidence of liver damage, gives an 80% chance of responding to treatment if the PCR genotype is 2 or 3. It's only 40% chance of responding if it's genotype 1. Patients should be avoid, uh, advised to avoid alcohol and also their sexual contact should be immunized. Virology screening for hepatitis B, C and HIV should be offered to all IVDUs and their partners. And vaccination against hepatitis A and B should be offered. The schedule is on entry to treatment and then one month and six months later. Post-vaccination hep B teaser should be performed approximately eight weeks following the original vaccination to ensure adequate response and you should have a teaser of more than 100 units. Hepatitis A vaccine booster is required every 10 years. There are several comorbidities associated with opioid addiction, and they can be physical or psychological predominantly. Physically, they get a lot of skin abscesses. They may also get potentially fatal subacute bacterial endocarditis, and they also get a lot of deep vein thrombosis and also perivenous abscesses. Psychological morbidity may occur in 50% of addicts, and these include depression and anxiety, insomnia, and patients with psychiatric comorbidities 
probably should be prioritised for treatment. There are lots of social problems enmeshed with opioid misuse, including uh, these are often associated with social deprivation, and often there is a history of parental addiction, both to opioids and alcohol. But the major problems associated with opioid addiction are those of poverty, debt, unemployment, self-neglect and neglect of family, increased criminality and homelessness. Let's look at management now. There are various options. You could have substitution, which is what most patients, most people opt for, which would be enrollment in a methadone maintenance program. But the other alternative is abstinence. This is very much a minority choice, may be achievable if the history of heroin use is quite short. You may first of all initiate them on a methadone reduction therapy to stabilize them on this drug first and then gradually withdraw the methadone until abstinence is achieved. Street heroin is usually uh, intravenously injected and may all be, also be inhaled or can be also uh, given subcutaneously. It's got a very short half-life. It's expensive, it's illegal, it's often contaminated with poisonous toxins and there's no quality control on the dosage of each injection. Methadone, uh, by contrast, is a very evidence-based replacement therapy for opioid-dependent patients. It's most effective when used as a maintenance agent at optimal dosing and the primary function is to reduce and eventually replace illicit opioid use. It has been shown to reduce harm and improve the health and psychological well-being of patients who were formerly addicted to heroin. It works by neuroreceptor blockade. Um, it prevents clinically, it prevents withdrawal symptoms and urges and cravings, and also prevents the use of other opiates. Methadone is a synthetic opioid receptor agonist. It's orally active with a long half-life, much, much longer than heroin, or approximately 36 hours. Most adult heroin users have a maintenance dose of somewhere between 60 and 120 milligrams daily. There may be minimal euphoria on starting, but the, addiction, the addictive quality is equivalent to heroin. Common side effects include sweating, nausea, and constipation. The advantages of it over heroin is that it's safer, it's free, it's legal, and there's good quality control. There may be serious side effects with it, in particular respiratory depression, or sometimes prolongation of the QT interval and ECG. And this can lead to potentially serious and sometimes fatal dysrhythmias, particularly tossant de point, which can occur at doses of above 100 milligrams a day. Risk factors for predicting these two serious side effects can be opiate naive patients, patients who use polydrug abuse, and also at the beginning of methadone initiation. What can minimize the risk with low dose supervised initiation and patient education about potential risks? There's a large evidence base for methadone now. And maintenance treatment is a very effective way, consistent with consistent positive results in randomized trials across various settings in various cultures and subcultures. It has been shown to de decrease illicit uh, opioid use, reduces injecting behavior, reduces risk of opioid-related death, it re decreases criminal activity, improves health and social function, and appears to have no significant effect on emotional and intellectual function. An alternative to methadone as an opioid replacement is buprenorphine, but this is not widely available in Ireland. A review done in 2008 in the Cochrane Database of Systematic Reviews by um, Matic et al., which was updated in 2014, showed that the use of buprenorphine reduced heroin use effectively compared to placebo, but it was less effective than methadone. This, the development of methadone maintenance programs in Ireland is 
based from a central base at the Central Treatment List in Dublin, and there's a complete register of all patients receiving methadone in the country. And this list is only available to doc prescribing doctors and to pharmacists involved in the program, but to nobody else. Doctors can apply to the Central Treatment List for a place on the list for a client, and this patient will receive methadone prescription only from one named doctor and it will be dispensed by one named pharmacy. In the year 2008, there were just over 10,000 patients registered on the central treatment list. The GPs uh, who prescribe the methadone and the methadone maintenance program in Ireland are of two types of level one and level two. This refers to the training they've had for methadone maintenance. Level 1 GPs can refer a patient to either a more experienced colleague or to a health service executive clinic for further assessment. Level 2 patients can, level 2 doctors can assess a patient before initiating methadone maintenance treatment. Now this assessment may take, or may take place over a few visits, two or three visits at least. And during these visits, the doctor will confirm the patient is taking drugs by doing urine analysis will assess their degree of dependence by checking for various symptoms of dependence, will check if there have been any complications so far from their previous illicit drug use, will check their overall medical history, in particular uh, infection history, etc. They will also check their psychiatric history and will evaluate them psychologically. They will also check their social and forensic history, um, check if they've, had, if they've had any past contact with methadone treatment services, and also assess risk behaviours. The targets in methadone maintenance treatment is opioid reduction or opioid free with the substitute. This occurs in 80 to 95 percent. And again, this uses methadone or buprenorphine, but methadone is the primary drug. Up to 70 percent cease opioids, that's illicit opioids, in three months, and the remainder reduce significantly. The other option, uh, other than the replacement program of the methadone maintenance treatment, is abstinence without opioid substitution. And that's opted for by about 20%. But these patients have to be well motivated. They usually have good mental health and good family and social supports. There is some crossover between the two groups. <coughs> so the, the object is to make sure that you start off with a low dose to minimize risk of initial overdose. So usually something like 10 to 30 milligrams daily and gradually titrating the dose up. The dose may, will become stabilized when there is no evidence of physical withdrawals and on urine uh, tox screening, illicit drug use has ceased. Initially dispensing through the named pharmacist is supervised. Daily initially, and then gradually increasing this to dispensing intervals of uh, several days, but never more than one week. Monitoring is usually done uh, in twice weekly initially, then weekly, and this would include urine analysis for other uh, polydrug use, and this is tailored to the needs of the patient. We would encourage the patients to take the offer of counsel support and social supports. Research in uh, UM and uh, University of Malaya here in Malaysia showed uh, that patients are better retained in programs if following their initial stabilization they were given, uh, they get a reasonable dose of methadone to keep their cravings at bay. And it was concluded in this study that a daily dose of at least 40 milligrams was required to retain patients in treatment and prevent reinjecting behavior. But they reckon that a dose of 80 milligrams per day was associated with best results. And that's kind of in line with the results in Ireland, where the, <coughs> the range of methadone use is between about 60 and 120 milligrams daily. Now, what happens to patients who destabilize and relapse? Well, this may be related to stressful life events, or it could be the onset, or a relapse of a prior psychiatric illness or it could be also seen that their life now on methadone maintenance is boring, uh, this life of sobriety is not attractive. <clears throat> it may be related to also chaotic lifestyle, relationship deteriorations, or re-exposure to risk viral diseases. 
season. These are the common problems and one experiences in patients undergoing treatment in the methadone maintenance program. They may be using other drugs, uh, opioid use in intravenously or otherwise smoking uh, on top of the methadone maintenance. They also be using additional drugs as crack cocaine and general cocaine misuse or alcohol and benzodiazepines. And one has to negotiate a contract with each individual child about how you will manage these situations. Are there predictors of mortality in patients on methadone maintenance programs? In Ireland, there were um, just over 1,500 deaths due to poisoning between 1998 and 2005. And of these, just under 20% were due to methadone, or methadone was involved at some level. The deaths may be used to uh, too much, taking too much of methadone, uh, co-prescription with other medications, and a deficiency in the organization and delivery of methadone programs. But there are some acute predictors of mortality. One is a prior psychiatric admission, um, people taking methadone breaks and losing their tolerance very rapidly. And so when they next restart methadone, um, they get respiratory depression, or they may be overusing methadone or methadone in conjunction with other opioids such as heroin. When is the risk greatest? Well, <coughs> it seems, excuse me, it seems in the first few weeks of starting treatment or restarting treatment if there's been a break. So that tolerability is lost and there may be too much methadone prescribed. So we always need to tailor the dose to individual patients. And there may be a period of instability in terms of uh, ongoing heroin use. The other risk time is on finishing treatment. This can occur voluntarily, a patient feels that he can do without the methadone, or a patient may be expelled from the program because of chaotic drug use and other um, risk behaviours and challenging behaviour within the clinic. This is also a period when mortality risk is increased. There may be predominantly a loss of tolerance to the toxic effects of methadone. Um, this is probably the most likely explanation for the deaths at the end of treatment. There's a link below here from a study by Marina Davoli on the risk of fatal overdose during and after specialist drug treatment from the Bedette study, which is a national multi-centre study, a prospective cohort study looking at this topic. What about special circumstances like methadone use in prison and pregnancy? In Malaysia, there is evidence that implementing methadone maintenance treatment in, in prisons in Malaysia works. And they can be effectively implemented, but they require adequate dosing and measures are needed to improve communication between prison staff and police authorities to prevent police harassment of methadone maintenance clients after their release and to improve systems for tracking release dates. But if all of these can be achieved, then it has a good profile in treating the prison population who are uh, addicted to illicit opioids. In Malaysia, with a population of 28.3 million, there are roughly 205,000 IV drug users. About 80,000 of them are HIV infected, 43,000 are prisoners, and about 6% of prisoners are HIV positive. That methadone maintenance treatment has been shown to dramatically use deaths from drug overdose, which is the leading direct cause of death, over the two weeks that immediately follow release from prison. Despite this evidence of their benefits in the community and in criminal justice settings, methadone maintenance programs have expanded very slowly and continue to have no coverage. So in setting up methadone maintenance programs within prisons, it is possible, but uh, it requires slow individualized dosing. And you need to develop strong relationships between prison staff and community-based clinics to ensure that on release from prison, there are no fatalities and no high-risk periods. And also between the improving communication between the prison authorities and the police authorities. Post-release retention on a methadone maintenance program can be hampered by police harassment near methadone maintenance therapy sites and force relocation laws which are major deterrents to continuity of care and relapse prevention. What about methadone in pregnancy? A maintenance dose 
uh, that at a dose that stops and minimizes illicit use is most appropriate for ensuring continuity of management of pregnancy and aftercare. Some mothers request detoxification, although during the first trimester, the patient should normally be stabilized and there is an increased risk of spontaneous abortion. Detox in the second trimester may be undertaken, but with small frequent reductions, say 2 to 3 milligrams every 3 to 5 days, so long as illicit opioid use through heroin is not continuing. If illicit opioid use continues, then you should stabilize the patient on a prescribed opioid, which may involve increasing the dose temporarily. Further detox should not be done in the third trimester, because maternal withdrawal, even if mild, can be associated with fetal stress, fetal distress, and even stillbirth. A point to note is that buprenorphine is not licensed for use in pregnancy. Here are some references for this video. There's a section from the Oxford Handbook of General Practice uh, on the assessment and management of drug misuse. There's also um, sections on quick medicine. You just go into the app and type in in the search box methadone and it comes up with a whole list of entries. Then there are references to the uh, papers by Marina, Do uh, Marina Davoli and also about the methadone maintenance programs in prisons in Malaysia and the two major Cochrane, method, uh, Cochrane, Cochrane uh, systematic reviews that have been done on methadone and buprenorphine. Thank you.